Our B series is a pop-up message series, and I have to tell you, it's one of my favorite because about every four or five weeks, we interview someone and get to hear a story and we get to hear their perspective on things. And so today, like Shauna said, it's our first live B series. And I am thrilled. Uh, This is probably the fourth or fifth in our series. And the way this normally goes is I sit down with someone from Chapel Roswell and have about an hour conversation. And from that hour conversation, Tyler and all of his magical editing cuts it down to a beautiful 20 minutes. So get comfortable. We're going to be here for a while. It's a joke. I'm kidding. It's okay. Um, Because of our time, I have a series of preset questions. I do not um, know what Chris is going to say. This is totally unrehearsed. However, we've agreed on some questions. In case you're wondering, we do not have a debate style mute button either. So we're just going to hang out and kind of have a conversation about some things. And so if you've never seen a B series, you're in for a treat. If you're curious about some of our other B series, we've done Be Called, Be Community, Be Diverse, Be Giving, and you can check all of those out on our website at another time. Today, we are Be Thankful. And our interview is with Chris Liner. So Chris Liner, meet Chapel Roswell. Chapel Roswell, meet Chris Liner. Hey guys, how are you? Good morning. In order to help Chris know who we are, if you wouldn't mind telling him your name. On the count of three, just go ahead and tell him your name. I'm sure he's going to get it all. You ready? One, two, three. Great. Uh, I missed one. Oh, (laughs) you missed one. Nice to meet you guys. So it's really nice to be here. Um, As we get started, I'm just going to ask you, take a minute and tell us, not just your name, but how have you been connected to the campus and for about how long? Sure. Um, My wife, Susan, and I uh, came to to the church here in 1987, uh, thereabouts. Um, I grew up Roman Catholic. She grew up Southern Baptist, and we kind of ended up here at uh, RUMC and... uh, Back then, all of our services were right here in this chapel, and uh, so it's very meaningful for me to be here and to worship with you, which, which we do fairly frequently. Um, this has become, over time, a support system and a community for us. Um, it, it's become a home, and um, we've grown up here, uh, spiritually and physically, um, I'm a lot older than I was back then, so, uh, but it's been quite a journey, and, and I can't tell you how much uh, that this community has meant to Susan and I. Thanks. We are going to jump right into it, and so I'm going to just ask you our first question. Yes. Can I, can I tell you I feel like I'm on ESPN game day, and we're going to talk about the Auburn Tigers or something? Oh, the Auburn Tigers, <laughs> what? <laughs> Coach, or the LSU. Coach O might come in and yeah. share some things. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I really, I'm going to ask you our first question. I know you've had some health issues in the last years. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. And uh, as I've thought about this for the last couple of days, uh, it's very hard to articulate in a sequential fashion because there were so many facets that we've, we've realized looking back that we didn't see at the time. Um, but, but I'll walk you through the journey, and, and it was very much a journey. So uh, the timing is kind of coincidental because it was about two years ago last week uh, that I got the news. Mm-hmm. Um, I had been um, not feeling badly, but over the, the year before that, uh, through the bulk of 2017, I'd had a couple bouts of, you know, just my stomach feeling queasy and like I didn't want to eat. And, and, and they just lasted a few hours at first. And then five months went by. I had another one. Lasted a little bit longer. I uh, was on a mission trip in Peru and had another one. And I just wrote it off to the food or the water or getting a little bit of something from being out of my own country. And, uh, and then on Labor Day of 2018, um, we, were, we were headed out on vacation. And I started having some back pain and really felt bad. My stomach was queasy. And it lasted two or three days. And um, 
at that point, I got over being a guy and decided, you know, maybe I ought to go see a doctor. And, um, and so I scheduled an appointment with my GI doctor. Um, took about six weeks to get in, so that got us into the early stage of November. Yeah. The initial labs, you know, he did, said, I don't think this is anything, indigestion, you know, just maybe, maybe an ulcer. Um, and then uh, about three days later, I got a phone call that said, I need you to go get a CAT scan. He said, uh, you've got some high uh, lysine levels in your, uh, in your blood test. It generally indicates something going on with your pancreas. Um, but we need to check it out. He said, don't worry about it. I don't, I don't think it's anything at all. So I went and had the CAT scan. Went to work. That was on a Friday. Went to work the following Monday. The phone rang about 2 o'clock. I was alone in, in our conference room. And he said, uh, uh, I, am, I, I don't know how to tell you this. I'm really shocked but you have a mass on your pancreas and you have a mass in your liver. Hmm. And um, I've grown up very scientific oriented. I love medicine. My brother struggled with cancer in 2005. Uh, I lost my mom to cancer and, uh, and so it was, it was quite a shock. Um, <clears throat> so he said, the first thing I wanna do is get you in and get a uh, uh, an endoscopy and get a biopsy, see what's going on. So we rushed to that in two or three days. And as I was laying in recovery <clears throat> from having that procedure, the doctor came in and he said, you know, it, it, I, I hate to tell you this, but this doesn't look good. It looks like, uh, we won't know until we get the pathology back, but it looks like pancreatic cancer. <clears throat> Classic, you know, pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Not a good diagnosis. No. That was, that was a very dark day. Um, for Susan and I, very sobering, you know, all of a sudden I had to admit I was mortal. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and so we, re we decided right then, we had a choice to make about how we were going to react. Were we going to fight and be positive or were we going to, you know, go in a hole and, and woe is me. And, uh, and we, <clears throat> we kind of made the decision to approach this as a gift, probably pretty strong, but a gift to be able to be a witness to what we believed and, and where we were going. So uh, about uh, four days later, I get another call at work. And uh, <clears throat> the doctor goes, hey, he goes, uh, believe it or not, I, you still have cancer, but I got better news. It's not... PDA, it's uh, in neuroendocrine cancer, which I almost fell out of my chair because my brother, who I just mentioned, had had neuroendocrine cancer in his liver in 2005 and miraculously is cancer-free 19, 15, 14 years later. So I thought, well, maybe shared genetics and, you know, the grace of God will get me through. Right. So that was... That was uh, a positive moment in the journey. So then they said, well, I need to get you to an oncologist. And uh, so um, I went back to my small group, my Sunday school, my sports system, and one of our members and very close friend, Kathy Newman, was a director of an oncological center for her whole career. And she's been my kind of cancer guide, if you will, through, through the whole process. So, you know, her first message was, she said, Chris, I know you. I know you're going to want to be part of your treatment. You're probably going to tell, want to tell the doctor what to do. <laughs> <laughs> but, but she said, you need to interview your doctor. You have to be completely comfortable that you guys are on the same page and that, and that you're working together. Mm. And so that got me to uh, Dr. Pradeep Jolly, a Georgia cancer specialist, uh, a lovely Indian man that uh, we, we hit it off right at the beginning. I explained to him what I needed to hear, no sugar coating, I know the medical terms, talk to me. And uh, so we hit it right off. Um, so there were, there, what I'm trying to gonna tell you here, there, there were God moments all along the way where when we looked back or when we were in those moments, we said, hmm, is that a coincidence or is that God? Right. And, uh, one of those was simply getting in to see Dr. Jolly because when I called for the appointment, they said, yeah, 
it's, uh, let's see, what is it, the 21st of November? We can get you in December 28th. Oh. Oh. <laughs> and I, I'm sitting there thinking, you know, I have something growing in me that's not good. Uh, you're yeah. going to bring me in five weeks from now? No. And she called back about an, uh, an hour later, and she said, I don't know who you know, but she said, your uh, GI doctor called, and we can see you tomorrow if you can make it. I said, we'll be there. Yeah. So anyway, the journey started from there. They took me to the north side, my case, to the north side tumor board, which is a, a collection of all the specialists that look at each cancer case and say, you know, what's going on here? How's, what's the best approach? First thing they said was, well, he's out as a surgical candidate. It's stage four, metastatic. It's on his pancreas, on his liver, on a mesenteric lymph node. Um, no surgery. Um, so we'll do traditional chemo. So the chemo treatment was every six weeks, um, three days, three days every six weeks uh, in the, in the uh, infusion center where I met, again, God moment, <clears throat> the most amazing nurses and PAs and nurse practitioners and, and, and staff that, you know, I felt like were only worried about getting me better. Right. And sorry, I get a little emotional about some of this. Um, but in the spirit of how can we be a blessing, as I sat around that big room with 25 other people hooked up to various IVs or, or injectables or treatments or pills or whatever, you know, I, I realized pretty quickly, I'm sitting here feeling pretty good working on my work computer, and there are people over here suffering and throwing up and, you know, very frail. And uh, so Susan and I both uh, decided, well, maybe we can be a light in this room. So I would drag my IV pole around and talk to people. And, I can um, see you doing that. Yeah. Chris, I have a visual of that. I can see you doing it. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I speak a decent Spanish. And I realized pretty quickly that cancer is indiscriminate. Gender, race, culture, ethnicity indiscriminate it's age. None of that. There were everything from 23-year-old pregnant young women to a 19-year-old tech football player to, you know, a Hispanic worker that didn't speak a word of English. And so I said, maybe I can brighten some of this up. So spent a lot of time talking to people. Susan brought them lunch from the cafeteria. Um, so I hope that helped. Mm -hmm. um, then, uh, so I went through nine rounds of that every six weeks, and the tumors were shrinking. Um, and um, so, you know, we coped, we coped with all of that. I had a routine. Um, you know, I didn't view it as too bad. Um, I just felt very tired, a little queasy afterwards, but you know, I'd say my symptoms were fairly mild relative to what some people have, so I was very grateful for that. Um, and, um, you know, again, the, as I was going through it, um, my way of coping was talking about it. So I started out with an email to about 10 family members and a couple of close friends. And I don't know how it happened, but organically, people started going, put me on the list, put me on the list. And, and, and I ended up, I think at one point, having 450 people on an email list. Um, and, and why is that important? Um, it, it, it was cathartic for me to talk about it. And um, I think it was, it allowed people uh, to be with me Right. To help them deal with me being sick. And every time I'd put out one of these mass emails about every six weeks, I would get back um, thousands of things. And one I wanted to talk about, you never know, unintended consequences. I got a call driving in the car one night, and it, and, and it, it was, I got an email. And, and I wasn't driving. Susan was driving. I read the email. I said, Susan, i got to read you this. And it, and it said, Mr. Liner, she said, I'm so-and-so, I'm a friend of a friend of a friend that sent me your email. My husband is going through something very similar, 
And we want to know if you would be willing to talk to us for just a few minutes to tell us about how you handled this. And so I gave him a call, and we had a few conversations, and I hope I helped him a little bit. Um, but, but my point is, you know, as you go through any trial in life, you can still influence people through your mm -hmm. behavior and the way you react. So that's kind of the first part of the journey. I remember those emails, and I've always been so impressed with you and Susan. As I'm staring at Susan, hearing you and watching Susan behind you, you can just feel her support. You can feel her beaming behind you. And I remember those days where people would ask, and you were incredibly positive. You only had positive things to say no matter what you're going through. And so your response really dictated how others were around you. It was amazing. Um, I want to ask you about your surgeon. There's a surgeon in particular that was important to you. Yeah, <clears throat> and, and depending on what radio station you listen to, you might hear a lot of Northside Hospital ads. And um, this doctor, Dr. Eddie Abdallah, um, had an ad on last year that ran for a long time. Um, how, I, how I got to him was um, after I'd finished the nine rounds of chemo, uh, Dr. Jolly said, you know, you've progressed pretty far. He said, I'm going to turn you over, I'm going to send you back to the tumor board for another, for a surgical consult to see if surgery's now viable. Um, and he came back and he said, yeah, Dr. Abdallah would like to see you get an appointment on Tuesday. So I went in and here's this, you know, lovely man, clearly of Arab descent, um, brown, swarthy skin, um, just a, a great guy. We hit it off immediately. I walked in. He said, you know, we met back in December, and this was, this was May. And I said, no, we didn't. He said, yeah, we did. He said, I met you in the tumor board when oh. I saw your first scans. <clears throat> he said, when I met you today, he said, I didn't even see the same person. He said, you, you have become from a non-surgical candidate to my perfect surgical candidate. Um, he said, you're, you know, you're young, you're, you're healthy, um, you know, you got a great attitude. And uh, he said, uh, I think we can remove what's left. And uh, so we said, well, okay, um, you know, what's the risk? He said, well, I can kind of tell you this. He said, if you do nothing, your, your, your risk of dying of this in the next five years, probably approaching 100%. He said, if we do this surgery, worst case, I reset the clock. Um, and he said, but to answer your question, he said, the surgical risk is probably, and I was, I was ready for him to say, you know, 15, 20% of dying on the table. And he said, you know, it's like 0.3%. So I felt like Kramer when getting the Starbucks award. Yeah, I'm in, you know, I'll take it. So, um, but then I said, uh, when I started telling, put, put out my email, one of my, one of my acquaintances said, uh, I can't believe you're going to let a Muslim man operate on you. Mm. And I said, well, if you had read his bio, you'd realize he's probably the top guy in the country. Been at MD Anderson 20 years, came to Northside. Um, and I said, I don't, I don't really care. No. You know, he's a child of God. Amen. And I don't care what he, what he, you know, believes. Amen. So the next time we went in to see Eddie, I said, uh, so, Eddie, Eddie, tell me about your name. <laughs> he goes, you mean Eddie? <laughs> I said, no, I don't mean Eddie. He goes, he said, yeah, clearly I have an Arabic name. He said, uh, it means literally servant of God. And he said, I'm a Lebanese Christian. God moment. It's a big God moment. So, yeah. So um, anyway... Um, last July 1st, um, what was supposed to be six hours of surgery turned into about nine and a half, mm -hmm. um, and I now have a 16-inch incision from my sternum to about three inches below my navel, um, but when he came out to see Susan while I was still snoozing, he said, we won. We won. We won. Um, so he took out uh, half of my pancreas. Spleen, gallbladder, uh, 37 mesenteric lymph nodes, and, uh, and part of my kidney, because he just said, man, it looked like it was a little close to your spleen. I don't want to take any chances. So, um, and oh, by the way, 
you had a, you had a major artery that was blocked by the cancer, and I put a, put a bovine graft in. So first one I've ever done. So, so. To look at Chris, you wouldn't know all of this has happened. Right. Um, you, you wouldn't know you've been through all of the trauma and treatment and come out. Right. Um, you look great. Tell me a little bit about what's here. Yeah, so other surprising moments along the way, just people we interacted with. Um, I, 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 worked, I, I knew a guy at work, um, but I didn't know much about him. And, and I guess the word got around. I was working down with the state of Georgia at the time as a, as a consultant. And um, one day right before Christmas, he came in with a, with a wrapped gift. And he said, my wife is a pastor at an AME church in East Atlanta. And he said, we want to give you this. And it's called The Promises of God. And, it, and it's, a daily, it's, a, it's a daily devotional, but it's got, you know, 365 <laughs> promises that are in the Bible. And, and a lot of people ask me, you know, what scriptures kind of got you through? Well, I could point to almost every one that's in there, but, but two that kind of stick out. One is, is uh, Jeremiah 30, 17, which says, I will restore you to health and, he- and heal your wounds. And, and another one that was, was pretty meaningful was John uh, 6, 47, which says, he who believes in me will have everlasting life. So, mm-hmm. you know, Susan and I realized whatever happened in this journey, you know, we believe we've got more. And so that was always um, comforting, for lack of a better word, to, it was our backstop against if this doesn't turn out right, which it couldn't, it may not, we never know, um, we've got that. Talk to me about Wesley's three rules. I know how important one of them is to you. Yeah, so, so that, that sort of, uh, that sort of w- was part of the basis for us deciding that how, how I reacted was how other people were going to react, okay? So if I was going around bitter and resentful and why did God do this to me, um, I felt like everybody else would respond that same way, that, that you, you get what you give, basically. And, and I didn't want to do that to anyone else, and I didn't want to do that to myself. So... Um, I thought back to Wesley's three simple rules, which I, I think kind of help us with how we behave in our entire life. I mean, the first one, most of you may know this, do no harm, very much like the Hippoc- part of the Hippocratic Oath, right? <laughs> let's let's not our, let our behavior is, when people know that we're believers, Jesus followers, let's not let our behavior tell them something different because not being consistent can drive somebody away or, or shake their faith, or whatever word you want to use. Second is do good always. So I tried to do that, you know, as I, as I encountered people along the way. <laughs> we took, by, by the end, it grew and grew and grew. By the time my last chemo treatment, we were taking in about $50 worth of Starbucks <laughs> <laughs> to all the people that took care of me every morning. So they, they, were, they were glad to see me every, every six weeks, so... Um, and, and some of them, when I go in for now checkups, still come running out and give me a hug and, you know, so most caring group of people I've ever met. Yeah. Um, the third one is stay in love with the Lord, which is probably the most important and drives the first two. But, you know, you stay close to the Lord and, and if you really look back on the, on the, and we're all going through something, I mean... If you have family, you're going through issues. If, you got, if you're alive, you've got health issues, um, marital issues, emotional issues. Um, if you've been in 2020, there's if, something. If you've been in 2020, Just you've got something. issues. Uh, you know, we've got issues right here. So, um, you know, many of us know people that have, that have, you know, either had COVID and survived or had COVID and not survived. So, um, I, I feel like it's about how you react, and how you let your faith get you through a lot of these things. It's very appropriate and timely, too, to talk about Wesley's three simple rules of do no harm, 
always do good and stay in love with God because to stay in love with God too is an act of communion. It's an act of eating together. Um, and so you mentioned having meals with other cancer patients and we're being prepared to have meals with families and friends. And so what a great way. I hope you all remember that for Thanksgiving um, as a part of staying in love with God is eating around a table together. Hmm. One thing as we close up, um, my question is, was there something that surprised you along the way? Do you have any surprises? Well, what, yeah, a couple, something that surprised me and something that I took away. The thing that surprised me, maybe, is, I don't know about the rest of you, but, but I always, I never really thought about it, but when, when I had this happen, I said, you know, I, I kind of went, does anybody care, you know? Have I affected anybody? And, and the amount of feedback and support that I got from this church, from friends, from bigger groups, um, was pretty amazing. And so I, 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 I was kind of surprised that, you know, I don't know, people even knew who I was uh, or maybe thought enough of me to reach out and say, what can I do? Um, so that was kind of a surprise. The, the, the second biggest takeaway coming through adversity, and, and by the way, I'm now 18 months past and my CT scans are all clear, so clearly a God moment. So, um, yeah, thank you. Uh, but, but what I learned is, is, you know, try to live a day at a time. Don't, don't get too far ahead of yourself. Make, make every day a good day. Try to affect somebody positively. And, um, you know, and continue to grow in your faith. So. Thank you, Chris. Yep. Thank you very much for sharing your story. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, for being here with them. Yeah, that was about a tenth of it. So if we, have, if we have eight hours sometime. Then, so. <laughs> and there's so many other preset questions we didn't even get to. And so many others I want to ask. If you have questions for Chris, normally we would say hang out after Chapel Roswell, after worship, and you can see Chris. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, because of our socially distancing and the six feet, we really ask if there's anything that you want to know more about or if there's something going on in your life that you want to talk about, um, all you have to do is email us and we will connect you with Chris. Um, we're more than happy to make those connections. I wish we had more time so you could hear more of his story. Um, I'm so thankful, though, that you shared the tenth that you did. I want to direct your attention, too, to a slide because I want to read you a scripture. As I know Chris's story and think about where we've been, um, there's a scripture that comes to me, and it's from Luke. As Jesus entered a village, ten lepers approached him, keeping their distance. They called out saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He bent down at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And then Jesus said, get up, go on your way. Your faith has made you well. There are things of trauma, and there are things of crisis, and there are things in our lives that make us feel like we are an untouchable, and that maybe no one knows us, or maybe someone has forgotten us. Hear the word today that that is not true. Hear the word today that no matter what has happened, no matter what is happening, there is a community that provides you hope and encouragement. You have a support system that includes many, many people, and we're a part of it. And so, as we go into a Thanksgiving week, may you always take the time to be the one to turn around and say thank you. May you find one thing that has happened this year of 2020 and be grateful for the one thing, because that act of gratefulness will make you well. I want to take a moment and have prayer with everyone. Um, as we go into this prayer, though, I would love to hear what you want to pray for 
This is a time of call and response. You're going to have to call out to me. If there's something happening in your lives that you want direct prayer for, we're going to do that. If there's something exciting happening or something that you're thankful for, we're going to spend a moment in prayer for that as well. If you are watching during our live stream or on demand or on the podcast, you're going to have to scream really loud for me to hear you. Um, But whatever it is happening in your lives too, know that the Spirit connects our prayer in this live moment to your prayer whenever you are watching. So what is it in the Chapel Roswell community that I can pray for you for today? Thank you. Hurricane damage. Anything else? Health. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think we ought to, we've got a lot of folks with cancer in the community right now. Let's keep them. Thank you. Anything that we're grateful for? Preachers. Preachers? Teachers. Oh, I said preachers. <laughs> Preachers. <laughs> teachers. We're going to go with teachers. <laughs> Community. Thank you. Time with family. Thank you. All right. New marriages. We have a few of those. If you feel like you're a newlywed, raise your hand. You don't even feel like you're newlyweds anymore? No. Okay. New marriages. Thank you, Maggie. All right. Let's spend time. And you know what? I'm going to say I'm thankful for all of you being here in worship. And I'm especially thankful for those under the age um, of 12. I'm so glad y'all are here too. Let's go to God for a moment of prayer. Gracious and holy Lord, we are coming to you with grateful and worshipful hearts. We thank you for the presence that we feel. And we know you're in our midst. And we know you've been a part of this conversation. And so it is with that knowledge that we approach you with an ask. And we know that you'll hear us. I pray this day for hurricane victims. There are many people along the Gulf and even further north from the Gulf that are continuing to reel and deal with all of the things that came with the hurricane winds and waters. And so be with those families and empower and strengthen the teams that are going to help them. Lord, we also pray for the health of our community and for our friends and families that we are thinking about. For anyone who's been diagnosed with cancer, we ask a special blessing on them. And may you send them the best surgeons. And may you guide the treatment plan. And may you guide those rounds of radiation or chemo or surgeries or whatever it might be ahead of them. But Lord, may you know that may they know, may they feel undergirded by support and by love. May your sense of comfort be imprinted on all of them. We praise you, Lord, for the medical team of doctors and nurses that continue to help and work. We also thank you for teachers. We know this year our teachers have been going through so many new things, new training, and new technology, and new ways to, to teach and educate, and we thank you for those teachers. We thank you, too, for our students and continue to bless whatever way they are learning. Um, We thank you for the patience and the confidence that they've all had. Lord, we also thank you just for community. We thank you for the many blessings that community brings. New marriages, new loves, new dating. We thank you for all these new relationships and may you bless newlyweds in this next year. May they know nothing but the excitement of being together and being a new family. Lord, you have fed us, you have gathered us, you have healed us, you have cared for us. And so may we do all of those things for others. And as we go into this season of Thanksgiving, may you connect our tables 
May you connect the lunch or the dinner that we will eat with the people that will be around that table. May you connect us to the many tables and hospitals and nursing rooms and the other homes and apartments. May you connect us to everyone who is calling out to you in your name. Bless all of the food and bless all of the people that that incredibly long table will represent. And as we are indulging, may we also be very mindful of the people who don't have that blessing. And may we work to bring food and water and shelter to all people in all places at all times. Lord, as we are traveling to see family, make us mindful of those that we may not see. Make us mindful of those um, making homes in different places. And may we always work to make sure that we all can experience and know your love equally. Lord, we are so thankful for all that you've given us. We thank you especially for Chris this day and his family. Be with them now and always. We ask all of this in the name of your son. Amen.